All it's right. nice with the fish over the top. Like that. We are. Yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Isn't it? Nice. <laughs> we're live. We're live. We're live. We're live. Um, welcome, everyone, to the live Lake Michigan Angler podcast here. Uh, I'm Michael, Rob, and uh, we've got a couple of guests with us today. And uh, we definitely want to make sure that we uh, open it up. Uh, we're going to have some questions, some Q&As here. Uh, we're going to get to all that in a second. But, Rob, you want to kind of outline what we're doing and what's going on and, and uh, our guests, of course. Yeah. So we've got Captain Dan. who doesn't need any introductions. And Captain Dylan over here from Legacy Sport Fishing, and uh, both have had some really, really good years. 2022 is a really good summer for both of them, and uh, they're kind of going to talk a little bit about that, and Dan's going to talk about some currents and how fish move and all that kind of stuff, so it uh, should be a pretty good talk. Yeah, absolutely. So welcome, uh, both of you guys, and uh, I don't know about you, but I'm excited about the season. Uh, we're already in our winter period right here. It's been kind of on and off for guys that want to do ice fishing, but we are, we're already seeing people excited to get back on the water. We're already getting a bunch of spring stuff. We've got uh, uh, Cove uh, Dodgers coming in. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff coming in now. So that's, you know, the and then, of course, we've got the Salmon School coming up. So these are all like the early signs that the season is upon us. Um, so as we uh, look forward to 2023, I, I'll open it both up for you guys and say, um, what is something that is ex uh, that you look forward to this season uh, as we as we kind of go underway? Is there something that, in your mind that you're looking forward to? Hey, well, first of all, thanks for having me here with you guys. <laughs> um, and uh, I did get my hair cut just for this. So, <laughs> yeah, it's been smelling like spring some of these days. It's been so warm, so I had to get rid of my winter scroungy look. Um, I don't know. The way that last year finished off with the deep water, uh, I was fishing over on the other side of the lake, and the two- and three-year-old kings were extremely good. So I, I think we're going to have a good year for kings this year. Um, um, along with all the other fish, so I think we're spring. Obviously, on our side of the lake, we get a really good coho run, and then uh, just like Dan, I went over to the other side of the lake, uh, the Michigan side, uh, for those who don't know, and did really well. Um, so with the good king population from you know four year olds to two and three year olds as well. That that did really well is an understatement coming from Dylan. Yeah, I <laughs> just gonna say it's I don't want to. I don't want to. Like, uh, expose anything over there, but you had a phenomenal experience over there. Can is, can, is it too much to ask? Can you break down what that was like for you? Um, as, I under, as I understand it, uh, you took your boat and you went across the lake, right? Yeah, we went up to uh, northern uh, Michigan, and honestly, it's a completely different fishery there than it is here. You know, we don't have, uh, out of North Point, um, so northern Illinois, we don't have all the currents and everything that de they deal with. So there is a huge learning curve going to a new body of water. Uh, luckily, uh, there's some great people over there on that side that definitely pointed us in the right direction, showed us kind of the ropes of how to fish there, what to do with a different wind, when the current's pushing one way, how to fish, and then, you know, what was working for them. So we were, you know, able to duplicate it, and, uh, you know, we had some pretty good success. Nice. Did... Uh... Well, for, for, let me ask you this. What was the experience like actually just boating across the lake? I mean, you don't hear that being done too often. Uh, I thought it'd be, it was, it was a lot of, of anticipation. Of, <laughs> uh, and then we left. The day we were leaving, we knew fishing was good there. Uh, there was four, there was like four to six foot waves. Charters were canceling their trips here. But uh, we left and just did a slow go for about three hours. And then when we got uh, midway across the lake, we were able to open it up because it was a big northeast wind. So... And the way home, it only took us about three and a half hours. So our boat was pretty, pretty quick. And yeah, it was, it was a good experience. But, you know, in the middle of the lake, it's pretty boring. There's no service. There's you just open water. You're not seeing dolphins like you would in the ocean or anything like that. You see you know, <laughs> just as many balloons. No, not balloons. Uh, that's, that's pretty cool. Did you notice any difference in, uh, in terms of, were you keeping an eye on your sonar, you know, underneath, seeing any kind of activity or fish on there at all? Yeah, we stopped on the way back and fished in uh, some pretty deep water, but only gave it about an hour. Uh, we caught a fish or two and then, uh, you know, came back. I basically was going on only sleeping a few hours a day when I was over there because, you know, fishing was so good. And I had people coming from over here, from over there to fish with us throughout the week. Yeah. Um, so 
that that's really cool and we'll we'll dive a little bit deeper into that because that was just like part one of that whole experience because um you guys had a phenomenal uh time out there and everything uh just want to take a moment to say welcome everyone and uh do us a favor make sure uh let us know since we've got this whole thing set up that you guys can hear us and see us uh give us a thumbs up i know we've already had someone say uh uh, they can't hear us so let's make sure we're all getting close to the mic and speaking into the mic so that they can uh, uh hear us all um uh uh troy said uh here we'll pull it up here uh troy said uh dylan's my hero <laughs> so, <laughs> there you go you've got fans you got you've got fans all right so uh we've got salmon school coming up i know we got we'll make sure we're going to talk about that uh of course um, and before we kind of get into that, um, uh, what were we talking about, Rob, with as far as like um, with everything coming in and uh, folks should be kind of thinking about how they're going to run their setups and uh, especially for the new folks. I don't remember what we were talking about, actually. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about so much stuff he's forgetting. Yeah. But, yeah, lots of stuff's coming in the store right now. Um, if you need anything, just every day something new is going to be here. Uh, we got in double O Dodgers this week. Tomorrow I'm getting a big shipment of Okuma stuff. Uh, Rods and Reels Dial stuff came. Um, almost every day I'm getting shipments of stuff. And when you're ready to get started and, and get ready for spring, get, get get your boats geared up, just let me know. We can help you out. Awesome. So, Captain Keating, let's talk about uh, let's talk about salmon fishing. This is what everyone's here to talk about. Um, where do you want to start at with the conversation here? Because I know I know you have a lot of thoughts and a lot of areas you want to touch on so th the floor is yours sir oh all right well you know it's you know there's so many moving parts to salmon fishing so why don't we uh you know let's start start out by talking about how do we find fish yeah. um you know because really you can have the prettiest boat in the world and all the right lures um best tackle but if you're not where the fish are at it's gonna be a boat ride yeah. so so how do we find fish i mean and you know we're gonna talk touch on it here you know um we're gonna take some questions later on but you know attend one of you know we've got 10 salmon schools coming up the first two are right here at rob's store january 21 and 22 we're gonna do a deep dive into this but i mean essentially you know um you know i've been fishing since um way too long since the late 1970s and and really there's basically three uh ways people go about salmon fishing for looking for fish there's there's, um, I'm going to call him Mr. Random. Okay, so Mr. Random, it's Saturday morning, and he's excited. He gets to the boat ramp. He heads out into the lake with not a lot of thought about where he's going to fish because he's just happy that he's not at work, at home facing the ever-growing honeydew list or that grass that's taking over his yard. So he's just happy to be away from, from everything. And, you know, no shame there. Nothing wrong with that. And then we have, let's call him Captain Straight Line. Captain Straight Line, he's going to run out into the lake to spot X. He's going to set up at spot X. He's going to troll to spot Y. And then he's going to turn around and go back to spot X. Good plan, bad plan? If there's fish between X and Y, it's a heck of a plan. If there's not, eh, not so good. Then we have, we have let's call him Mr. Analytic or Mr. Inform. This guy, he's going to do his research before he goes fishing. He's going to step back, look at the big picture. He's going to realize that, you know, um, everything is tied to the seasons. The, the migration patterns of each species is tied to the seasons. It's tied to the currents. He's going to start taking, keeping good records, keeping good track of what's going on, so that when he's out there fishing, he's noticing where's, what are the winds like in July when he's fishing? Where's the thermocline at? Where are the fish at? What structure are they on? When the wind shifts and comes out of, say, the north or northwest or whatever, he'll start keeping track of that. This guy is going to keep track of things. So as time goes on, he's going to actually have a really good idea of where to fish before he even goes out fishing. Um, some people might think that's overthinking it, but the guys that catch a lot of fish, that's how they think. So those are just like three basic ways to summarize how we approach, you know, looking for fish out on the lake. That's actually... Uh... Uh, pretty interesting. We we might actually have a, a, a captain straight 
What'd you call him? Captain Straighten? Captain Straightline. Captain Stra- oh, look who who's here. Hey, what's going on? Uh, Captain Sean Culin's in the building. I'm here for trout fishing, he said. <laughs> <laughs> well, we should have Sean here to teach us on trout fishing. I yeah. usually just tell everybody that comes in the store looking for fish report, just follow Sean. <laughs> then you don't have to worry about anything. Yeah. Well, there's some truth to that. Like, honestly, a lot of it is, like Dan said, you know, you're picking up the wind patterns. But one more step that, I mean, I, I just do it on the weekends. I'm not a full-time charter captain or anything like that but i you know communication if you have a network of people that are going out as well like not that the fish are always going to be there the same day but at least it's a good starting point because going blind into the lake so you know sean blake caleb and josh they all help everybody and that's our little network here at north point that you know we all use and there's other captains as well so in some form uh, I, I think most of the successful captains around the lake are doing that, you know, networking. Because if you don't know if the fish, you know, are biting a few miles south of you or 20 miles south of you, and sometimes the wind and the waves and the current is pushing that those fish that were in one spot a lot further than you might think the next day. Let me ask you, you both this: uh, We've seen the explosion with social media in terms of in terms of how it. Uh, has helped and educates to an extent the greater fishing community. Uh, people are part of various groups. How reliable would you say, um, if, if I'm just the average guy, I'm in the whatever Facebook group for salmon fishing and people are mentioning how they went out and they caught fish. Um, how should people kind of interpret those, what I would say, Facebook fishing reports? Yeah, great question, Michael. Um, you know, there's a lot of information you can find before you go out fishing. Um, but just remember the information you're getting um, is only as good as the person who's fishing and, you know, not taking a dig at anyone um, because there's a, a huge range of experiences. So one guy's bad report may just be that he was in the wrong spot or didn't have a lot of experience. So what I'm saying is that don't go by negative reports that the fishing is bad out of your favorite harbor, whether that's Kenosha, Racine, Muskegon, whatever. Um, so as you're two things that I look at for here guys can get into the facebook pages all the harbors have them start just paying attention to the guys that are posting and the guys that are actually giving information they're not just thumping their chest with their pictures that's cool but they're actually helping people so you might listen to those guys a little bit more um but what what i find that could be a really good key for people is to look at the charter boats that fish out of the harbor that you go out of because the whole um you know i ran charters full time for 36 years um before the back let loose and uh actually thought about getting a boat and chartering again this year and (laughs) the back started letting loose again this winter so uh we're putting that thought on hold with that big boat but i have dylan to fish with so um anyhow so what what i'm where am i going with this one oh yeah so um so the charter business has changed so a lot of customers you know they they're kind of watching the reports they want to go when the fishing's good so captains know that so they're going to be post. They're posting pictures constantly. Mm-hmm. So find out who who are the captains in your harbor. Kind of watch their pages and see who's putting up the catches of fish. That's one way to tell what fish are off of your harbor by their posts. Um, so that's my two cents. And uh, how about for you? What's your take? Your thoughts? Don't hold back. (laughs) I think there's good reports and there's bad reports. I mean, there's sometimes there's those reports on the pages I'm on, at least out of this harbor. And, you know, they're pretty spot on about where most of the people I know are fishing. I don't know exactly what they're using or what angle. Like, I think one big part that is missing um, in all those reports is, you know, the angle of how, you know, they're going through the water. Because that's a big thing here. We're always asking each other, okay, like, what's your heading? And that's just making sure it's how your like your boat's pointed exactly, essentially. But yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so that that's an important part. Hopefully, folks kind of take that uh, and, and and use that because it can be very daunting with the sheer volume of of posts up there. A lot of these groups have thousands and thousands of people at this point, and uh, you, you you know you make a great point about. Um, one person can say how bad it was for them and how they fished. You'll scroll up four posts up and the same guy or a different person in the same area killed it. 
and you know it's kind of a testament to the how he can be so information and having a network um very important and uh i'd even go so far as to say you know go out and book a trip with a, with a captain um it, it's not necessarily to just go to catch fish but take the opportunity um to go on there and pick their brain that trip you know pick their brain on on how their approach is what how they're going about stuff um, I, I generally think, and you could probably speak to this, is that most captains are pretty cool with sharing information on the trip and saying, yeah, this is how I'm doing things. Or, And if I'm wrong, let me know. But I, I think that's the case. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good investment. You know, if you, if you let's say you fish out of Winthrop a lot or maybe you you fish out of St. Joe a lot or wherever, find a captain in that area, um, you know, call them up, ask them questions, say, hey, I, you know, be up front with them. Say, yeah. hey, I've got a boat. I want to learn how to fish. Um I want to go out, going to book you. Not about catching, you know, a limit of fish. It's about me learning from you and just kind of see if, you know, some guys are really helpful with that. Um, other guys, not as helpful, but great investment and pick their brain while you're out there. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Um, all right, moving along. Uh, and I want to make sure you guys uh, that are watching know that we will open it up for, for Q and A. So get those questions ready. Uh, anything goes, any kind of questions, salmon, trout fishing, uh, Small boat, big boat, whatever it may be, it's all a uh, fair game when we get to that portion here. Um, uh, Captain Keating, we had some some other things to talk about, uh, and, I, and I know you have a, a list with you as well because we want to make sure we cover some some important points. Um, what was another thing that, in your mind, was something we need to talk about is uh, starting for the season? So, yeah, so in regard to, um, like, on finding fish? Yes. Yeah, okay. So yeah, in regard to, you know, finding fish, um, how do we find fish? Um, I'll make a shameless plug to come to my salmon school. But, um, you know, outside of that, you, you know, getting your network. Um, I think Rob's going to post all these guys' phone numbers up on your page afterwards all the charter boats, yeah, yeah, all the, <laughs> yeah so you can text them for the information <clears throat> i'm sure josh and caleb won't mind that at all um no anyhow so one of the things that you know that um i always see a lot of people they just run out and they head to the biggest crowd and they set up where the crowd of boats is at that's probably not the best way to fish looking for a crowd um so one of the things that i you know try to talk about and i did i do this when i'm fishing is using your electronics to find fish before you put a line in the water because, you know, when the fishing's good and you know where the fish are at, it's a bloodbath. Anybody can catch fish. But it's when the fishing gets tough, and we will have tough days. No matter how good the year is, we'll have tough days. Um, so you learn how to use your electronics. Um, that's one of the things I was impressed with fishing with, with Dylan this year. He's really good with his electronics. Um, but one of the things that I always do is I'll, you know, run out there to the area I want to fish and I will actually before setting lines up I'll start slowing down and using my graph looking for marks looking for bait um, going somewhere between 10 and 20 miles an hour where the graph works every boat's different um, the reason I'm doing that is the alternative is just to go out put your lines in the water and start trolling at two miles an hour and you're not covering any ground at two miles an hour and once the sun's up those fish they don't just sit under your boat they move so you don't know if they're there or not so, you know, learn to use your electronics, um, looking for fish. Um, if you don't have a fish hawk, uh, a temp, temp probe and speed probe, you know, those are invaluable, especially in the summer for finding the zone where the fish are at. They're super, super helpful with figuring out the current. And really, you know, understanding the currents is, you know, probably 90% of the battle. Um, yeah. That's like a, a full day conversation, uh, you know, in, in terms of the intricacies of how that is why it is in in how this lake is very unique when it when it comes to currents it's not like an ocean per se where it can be more predictable based on tides and so on and so yeah. forth here it's it could be a wild west right? yeah just driven by the wind yeah. uh that coriolis effect that you talk yeah. about all sorts of things that we don't really think is going on no and you know it was only recently when i looked um with some weather event we had and uh i zoomed out on on the on the map on the lake with this weather and you just see the winds in every direction. It's not like we're on this side of the lake on the western side and our our winds on the particular day might be out of the northeast or whatever. But if you're south, if you're way up north, it's there's all kinds of different winds. So that stirs that whole body of water up, which leads us into uh, that whole <laughs> situation. Um, you mentioned that you learned uh, you learned some stuff from from Dylan about uh, the sonar. Could could you expand on that? I'm curious as to what what that may have been. 
Oh, um, just using like the pan optics. Oh. You know, we, 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 the one, the one time we tried to do this, we started talking a little bit about that. <laughs> well, we're not going to talk about the, it's been a bad, all right, I'm going to say this now. It's been a bad run for, for, uh, for me specifically with the podcast, because I've now botched, uh, two episodes. So I apologize to Captain Keating and, uh, and uh, also Nick Von Gumpel, who's actually kind enough to come back Saturday to retape. Um, we had technical <laughs> issues. I may have deleted the file that had the, the recording, uh, but uh, we're, we're making up for it now. Um, Panoptics, uh, how long have you had it? How, what, what's been the impact for you? Uh, it, it makes a big difference when you're fishing shallow water, but I've had it. Uh, so we've had, we got the, my dad purchased the boat last year and we set it all up with brand new, all Garmin, everything. Um, I'm a big Garmin guy. Uh, so we got it all set up and it makes a big difference when you're fishing shallow water. It, it doesn't necessarily do the best, you know, when you're out in 300. Um, but when you're in shallow water, you're, you're seeing in real time, the fish come into your spread and instead of, you just seen a blimp at 40 feet down, you know that it's 40 feet down and 15 feet to your right. So you know that you could be adjusting your riggers or it could be further um, to the side of your boat. And now you're playing with your dipsies and your coppers. So it, it, it's just a game changer. Um, Have you noticed that you're able to dial things in faster because uh, of that? Because you know how they're responding to something and where it's in the water column, you can make those adjustments a lot quicker. Yeah, because you can see the fish come up to it, and then if they're hanging out there and they're just not biting it, you could, you know, start moving it and adjust. You can make adjustments, micro adjustments in real time and see how the fish reacts to that. Uh, and you could see them like come into your spread, just check it out, or if they're just swimming through your spread. Yeah, super cool stuff. Thunderhead 870 said, I went to dance school last year. Well worth it. Tons of info. We'll be going again this year. Awesome to hear, um, Thunder, and um, de definitely well worth it. it. And let's talk about that. Um, it's coming up here on the 21st and 22nd. Yep. Right here at Lake Michigan Angler. Um, you can go to uh, Captain Di CaptainDanKeating.com. We'll pull it up on here for you guys so you have it on the screen so you see where you need to go. Um, can you cover what day one and day two is going to be uh, covering? Yeah, yeah. Um, so day one is uh, called Salmon Foundations, and it's, um, it's the nuts and bolts of, of salmon and trout fishing. We're going to look at, we're gonna, you know, look at the uh, boat setup and tackle a little bit. We're going to look at lures. I mean, there's a ton of lures and attractors and meat rigs and all that stuff. We're going to look at that and help make sense of that and how to run it. We're going to look at all the different delivery devices, um, apparatuses, copper, lead core, downriggers, divers, um, stealth divers, torpedoes, you name it. We're going to talk about how to run all of those things properly. And then we're going to talk about how to weave them together because there's a lot of multi, especially in this area, a strong multi-species fishery. So if you learn how to put all the parts together, whether it's with six rods or 20 rods, you're going to catch way more fish. Um, and then the final part of that, we're going to look at um, the spring ABCs. How do you find and catch fish in the spring? Um, we're also going to look at electronics. I forgot to mention that. Day two, advanced tactics and seasonal strategies. That, um, that one normally sells out, so sign up for that if you're interested in it. Um, that's a deep dive into all things fishing, uh, salmon fishing. We're going to look at currents. We're going to look at how they impact the fish how they impact our boats and trolling gear. And we're going to look, more importantly, we're going to look at how, you know, in this area, we have a lot of structure here between Waukegan and Racine. Yeah. So we're going to look at how the different wind regimes at different seasons change the current, change the thermocline, move the fish around. We're going to look at how they move different species around because a king is going to react differently than a steelhead or a lake trout or a cull. So we're going to look at that. We're going to take a seasonal approach and talk about each of the five main species. And we're going to talk about how to locate them and catch them and the lures to use spring, summer, and fall. So that's what we're going to be doing. You can find out more information at CaptainDanKeating.com. And I just want to back up and add one thing when Dylan was talking about the panoptics, yeah. which was really cool. Um, he was telling me that you know he was actually changing certain lures because he was watching how the fish were reacting to his spread in real time on a sonar. And I remember the first time we went out, went out with you, we were out, me, um, and you were showing it to me and I was like, it was out in deep water and it's like, okay, this is great. 
Um, but then, like I said, I was impressed with Dylan's use of electronics. By August, Dylan had figured it out. And now he, the one day you kicked our butt. Um, and, and he told me later, well, I saw what the fish were doing and how they're coming in and what they're looking at and not biting. So we're changing lures now to get the lookers to bite. I thought that was genius. So uh, that yeah. is a game changer. It is. It is. Um, uh, so, yes, you guys saw the link. Sign up. It'll be here. Uh, not only can you get the information, he's going to talk about everything he just covered, uh, but we're going to have a lot of the gear in. And we got stuff on the table. We'll get to that here in, in, shortly. But we'll have all the Dodgers are coming in, all kinds of stuff. Um, in fact, I'll pull up a question here from David. Uh, asked, what new color spoons does, does Moonshine have coming out for 2023? Anything, Ralph? You know what? I don't even know yet. <laughs> all right. We're doing our job here at the store. <laughs> he, he always takes a long time to announce his new colors. Well, what's for last year did well. The the uh, the Gobi spoons the Gobi really series well. they yep. did really well. The yellow did really well. Yeah, that was that was uh, pretty cool spoons. And uh, uh, let's uh, and guys, we're gonna start taking questions. So just start putting them in the chat. Uh, we're gonna get that ready. I'll queue them up here in the in a second. Um, but we'll still continue on with uh, Captain Keating here. Um, so we talked about finding fish. What's the next step in the, in the process then? Oh, where do you want to start? <laughs> pick, pick a spot. Pick pick a, a, oh, Lord. Um, okay. You find your fish. Now, how does someone go about thinking about what the hell am I going to put in the water to, you know, catch what, I'm, what I've found here? You know, I found them on my sonar. I found bait fish around here. I found schools of, 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 of bait. What am I – how should someone think about their spread and – which should they start off with? Okay, yeah, it's a big it's a big question. So let's go up to 30,000 feet. Um, so first of all, what is the season? Is it spring? Is it summer? Is it fall? Because different things are going to work at different times of the year. For example, in the spring, if you're starting really early, uh, maybe going out now like some guys are doing, or, you know, Indiana, south, southwest Michigan, in the spring when the water's below 40 degrees, below 41, then that's a lot of crankbaits. Once it gets over 42, for at least for cohos and rainbows, then the Dodgers, Dodgers and flies. So, you know, that's one thing. So, I mean, essentially, so, you know, think about what's your target species. What are you targeting? Are you targeting cohos, kings, browns, lakers? Okay, that's going to influence what lure you're doing. What if you're fishing for multiple species? Okay, well, within your spread, whether it's six rods or 12 rods, start designating certain rods. Like these three rods, we're aiming for cohos. So we're going to put coho lures on. These three rods are going to run deep for kings, so they're going to have a king lure. Um, these three rods are going to be for steelhead, steelhead lures, and then three rods are just kind of wherever. So <laughs> start thinking about that way. And that so gives you a nice it. mixture and, and variety. You, you can, you know, what one of the things that I try to do is bring, you know, um, make sense out of the confusion, you know, um, because it, it's really easy to chaos just to take over between all the different line types, all the different lures. It's a big lake, so start making sense out of things. So being more strategic, more systematic with how you look at everything um, will ma help make it a lot easier. Let me, let me, I'm going to ask you both this question, all right? Uh, it's a small boat guy. He's just got two riggers and just two dipsies. Just say four rods total. What, what, what would you suggest each of these uh, setups to be uh, run with or have on it? What would you say? Uh, okay, so... Um, let me just say, if you're fishing in a small boat with four rods, you're going to have better boat control than a big boat, so you can stay on top of the fish. Um, you can also focus on those four rods and change them a lot more aggressively. If you're running 15 rods, you're maintaining a lot of stuff. Yeah. So it really depends on how far down in the water column you're going for those four rods, okay. um, and it depends on the species. So, you know, spring's just right around the corner, so if it's spring and you're running two downriggers and two dipsies... Um, in this area, it's going to be a double O size, either a Jensen Dodger, a baby spin doctor, or a stubby Dodger with coho flies, you know, the little peanut flies or yeah. a slider fly. Me, I'd run the two downriggers for kings because I'm always trying to catch a big fish. But if you just wanted cohos, put the coho rigs, you He's know, on, on the two downriggers too. Yeah. And for you, Don? Yeah. If, depending on the time of the year. And I, I, well, since he gave the spring setup, we'll just give you like a summertime. What's the summertime wombo combo? Two riggers, two dipsies. Uh, in the summer around here, uh, if the silverfish kind of seem to move on, definitely one of those uh, riggers and probably a dipsy down at the bottom trying to you know get a lake trout or okay. two, um, yeah. depending on the time of the day. If it was early morning, 
uh, probably in the water, thermocline was set up and that warm water was all the way down, or the cold water was down and there was, you know, top 50 feet was warm, I would be targeting, I'd have one out of temp and then the rest, you know, within temp to uh, try to target a king. I'd probably have a moonshine or an ace high plug uh, out as well, in addition to the paddle. But yeah, that's usually the best for me. Wait, wait a minute, Dylan. Target a lake trout. <laughs> Dylan is the only guy I know who breaks out into a rash when a lake trout hits the floor oh, of his boat. Yeah. I, I think he's getting good with his electronics so he can avoid the lake trout. Is that what it is? Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> there's a time and a place to catch him. <laughs> yeah. he, he's so red right now. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Um, let me pull up, pull up a question here, um, and we'll kind of weave in and out a little bit here. Uh, all right, question from Bill. Can you discuss how it's important to follow depth contour lines? Sure. So, okay, so currents, there's a... So the currents tend to run parallel to the shoreline. Um, I believe on all the Great Lakes they do that. So a lot of times the fish will migrate with the currents. The currents are gonna get on the drop-offs. Um, especially in the summer, our kings and cohos, and sometimes the steelhead, they will get on drops, whether that drop-off is between 70 and 100 feet or you know out in 200 feet of water. And the, the, there's gonna be bands of water. So. Number one, if those fish are holding on that structure, if the fish are in 72 feet of water, you want to keep your boat in 72 feet of water. Um, also, if they're just migrating along that path, you know, it's important to stay with them. The other thing is because the currents a lot of times are parallel to the shoreline, for whatever reason, we can get our speed right, you know, when we're going either with the current or into the current versus cutting the current, yeah. which is a whole other topic because there are times when cutting the current, going sideways to the current, for whatever reason, we'll get the bites. But usually, going with it, with the current or into it, is typically going to produce more fish. It, it's it's crazy. Um, it's something I've noticed more and more over the years, especially probably this year. Like you said, how these fish will ride like a certain band of water, which is probably like yeah. how you said that's that whatever that contour is about it. There, you'll go into like seventy five, and you'll between seventy five and eighty five, you'll see a lot of fish. The minute you slide in or out of it, it's they're not. Is prevalent you know? and there's also you know with these drop-offs there's nooks and crannies in the drop-offs there's bends there's drop-offs outside of drop-offs there's humps there's variations in the bottom most people don't pay a lot of attention to the bottom i've done a lot of saltwater fishing and when you're fishing the bottom you better know what the bottom's like to catch you know snapper and grouper or kingfish at times so i've always paid close attention and so a lot of times there's you know the inland fishermen i think they call it microstructure um but so when you're following contours, you know, there's, there might be something there that's going to hold a fish like a king or a lake trout on it. Um, and the last two years I've done, you know, especially last year, I did a lot more fishing in Michigan than I've, than I've been doing. And it's the same over there. The guys I'm fishing with, you know, they've got their key structure areas just like we have here. And those, those features are holding fish. The average person doesn't know it. He goes through it he catches two or three fish and he keeps on going mm -hmm. but the guys that know what's there and how to fish it they're going to spin around they're going to work it so yeah great great advice um let's pull up this one from let's see here aaron holloway is fishing out of holland michigan midsummer we are uh we are on fish in say 150 feet of water 50 to 70 down temp at about 50 uh, then there's a two-day hard north, north blow. Which way would you head? Where would the fish... I'm sorry, let me reread this. Uh, which way would you head? Where would the fish get pushed to? You happen to know it? So, we, this is where we give them JR's number over in Holland. <laughs> we give them JR's number. Yeah. No, okay. So, I, you know, I don't know if, if it's... it's um, who, who gave this question? It's from Aaron Holloway. Okay, so I don't know if Aaron can respond to this back through his messenger. Probably so can. Yeah. when you get a hard north blow out of Holland, does that push your thermocline down and warm your water up and push the fish offshore? Or does that bring the cold water up and bring them in? Yeah, it's going to be different for your side. Yeah. You know, my, um, yeah. Yeah, my guess in Holland, it's going to warm it up in the summertime. So... Could that's going to either push the, like over here when we get, when our water warms up and we get the onshore blow and it piles it up in the summertime, you're going to get some fish that are going to drop to the bottom because that's where there's cold water. 
And sometimes the bait, the alewives, will just drop down. Yeah. So they're going to drop down. And you're going to get other fish that they boogie. They just go out, and they're looking for the cold water, and they go offshore. Yeah. Uh, question from Thunderhead870. Last year in, in – uh, I always screw say Rob, do, do me the honors. Manitowoc. Thank you. Uh, Sheboygan area. <laughs> the Rainbow, I can never say it. It's, it's all these years. I still can't. Say it three times. No, three, no, no. Three times, Manitowoc. Like, no. I, I slaughter yeah. it every time. Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> I'll just defer to Rob. Uh, so uh, in that area, Sheboygan area, the rainbows were nearly non-existent. Any thoughts on that? Water was very cold for the first part of the season. Uh, we didn't catch many rainbows down here yeah, last yeah, year. Yeah, I was going to say, well, down here was pretty much the same. Yeah, I, I didn't really hear, um, but I also don't talk to people in every port across the lake. But I didn't really hear of any crazy rainbow catches this year outside of like a day or two yeah last remember i distinctly remember last august was phenomenal uh yeah like 2021 yes was yeah 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 because like, we're in 2023 yeah sorry yep 2021 we had a ton of steel that was amazing and you don't see two years in a row like that too often so yeah. i think a lot of fish got caught and sometimes steel are just random and just out in the middle of nowhere where we're not going fishing we just we we stay relatively close to shore you know yeah yeah all right uh let's see here from uh adams sutra i bought a boat last year with the intention of fishing this year out of winthrop harbor i have a three to three to thirty five hundred k budget for electronics what brand would you suggest and which technologies first thanks anyone dan rob uh, Dylan, let's start with you. <laughs> I have my thoughts on this too. I'll, I'll, I'll chime in as well. Yeah, it really depends uh, like what your boat already has or doesn't have. Um, I have a little boat. It's not really set up exactly uh, how I would want it, but we have like the, the Lawrence and stuff. But I'd start out with a good transducer and a good screen, and then you could easily get that for probably around there. Mm -hmm. um, I think. I'm a big Garmin guy. I know Garmin has those package deals every now and then where it's like two grand or $2,500 for a transducer and that. And sometimes it even includes that you wouldn't need it, the radar as well. But, and just making sure that could incorporate with whatever you need it to. Um, but yeah, I would invest all your, most of your money in that transducer and then your screen. And if you have any left over, then, you know, get a fish hawk as well. Yeah, you know, and the, the transducer, it's more of a thing for the bigger boats. If you're just going out in, like, a 17-footer, like your regular skimmer transducer that it comes with is probably going to be fine. Yeah. But in, like, your big boat, then the upgraded transducer makes a big difference. Yeah, and I, I would I would add to that um, uh, definitely kind of like what, what, what Dylan said. Um, it's been my personal opinion. I know I've kind of debated this with Rob. Um, I think... I think live scope for salmon fishing specifically, like it's not it's not necessarily new out in the market. It's been bass fishing, walleye, crappie fishing for some time now, but I really think it's going to be widely discovered uh, this year more than ever for salmon trolling, and I think that's going to be the next kind of technological advancement with salmon fishing is is guys implementing it, seeing their spread, seeing the reactions. You can doubt this dial things in a lot quicker so I, I would say if you had that budget um i'm also i don't have an affiliation with garmin either and uh but uh they released their live scope xr if you have a boat that gives you 500 feet of range and i think if you're in a boat that's probably the way that's the way to go um they designed these new versions to specifically kind of be used for trolling whereas the og way was to use the old P, the ps30 panoptics you know that was like a hack uh that they created in the community um, but now with their newer stuff, it's better range, clarity, target separation. Um, I've been using it on my kayak, and it's been incredible to see. So I think that's where uh, it can be. If you have the money for it, um, you can implement that into your setup. And I, I think it's it's really incredible what it can do for you. Uh, all right. Let's see another question here for Captain Dan from uh, Brandon. Uh I've, uh, I'm signed up for the Green Bay, Wisconsin class, and I saw it's only one day. Do you cover both day one and day two subjects in the one Green Bay class? Do I cover, uh, Green Bay is only a one day school? Yes. Um, no, we don't cover both schools. It's gonna be the day two school. It's gonna be the more advanced. 
Um, but we'll we'll roll some of the stuff from day one into that. So yeah, so just just that one. Right. I'd have to talk really fast to put both days into one. <laughs> <laughs> or Brandon, uh, catch him maybe after the class and pick his brain uh, if he if he has a chance and see if that helps at all. Um, next question here from Thomas he, uh, Head. How do you choose a flash or fly combo? Uh, Rob, does that make sense? Roy, Roy. Oh, the red, orange, yellow, the color scale. Oh, the okay, depth. okay. Really struggle with this one. I'll defer to anyone on the panel here. Well, for me, if I'm fishing for cohos, I'm gonna have a red Dodger out there, or a yellow Dodger. Pretty much, you know, I'm always gonna just gonna start with that. And then when I'm fishing for kings, I'll usually start the morning uh, with one white, one green, and one chrome. And I just let the fish tell me what they, they want. I don't really worry about everything else. It's, I tend to catch fish on those colors at almost any depth. Let me ask you this. Have you noticed this for everyone? Have you noticed that certain orange dodger or a white paddle uh, that a fly seems to do a little bit particularly better for you than, say, another color fly? And if so, what, what would that look like what combo would that be for you well you know what it was always like the the dragon slayer and the bullfrog right but bullfrog works behind anything sure so i don't find that there's like a specific combo that you always have to keep together you can mix and match anything you want and there's just certain flies they want all the time a bullfrog a super frog you know just a green crinkle all that they're pretty consistent fish catchers and you can put them behind anything without overthinking it too much just you know that they work consistently all the time and you're, you're gonna catch fish then gotcha dylan for you uh, one of my go-tos when I'm trying to uh, fish for kings, depending on time of the year for sure, but is a double chrome green crank from Howie. Uh, I'll always have that out, usually on a diver, and uh, it's, it's always a staple for me. Wow, I think you're the first person I've seen actually pulled up just the, the stock chrome on chrome. Double, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to keep it basic. And mm -hmm. another thing when you're doing it, you're selecting the fly with the flashers. I mean, you could look at it and just like see in your head it's hard to explain <laughs> it looks just say it looks sexy together right? it's, like, it's hard to, yeah it's, and if it like think about it like a shirt and pants like if they don't match you, your wife or like you probably won't notice but your wife will probably tell you like hey that doesn't look good and, like, <laughs> if it doesn't look good don't put it in the water it might not catch a fish so all right dan for you any thoughts on uh... yeah i i think that they're um you know i i think that um, I look at the flasher and fly, dodger and fly, I look at it as a team. So, I mean, I do, I, you know, I'm trying to bring order out of the chaos. So one of the things that I've always done is I'll find which certain flies work better behind certain flashers or dodgers, you know, for cohos, for kings, for steelhead. And so I'll start identifying those patterns and just keep running that fly behind that flasher. Um, but I think he specifically asked about red, orange, and yellow Dodgers mm -hmm. in the question. So, I mean, typically in the springtime, it's going to be a red base or a yellow base. You know, one of those will be better than the other. Um, and, and it does make a difference because, you know, when I chartered, I had access to way too much information. And still when I fish now, because I still have a lot of friends, and you may have 10 rods out not doing anything, and somebody will call you and they've got a yellow one, a clown with red spots and you only have a yellow one out and you flip it over and you put the one with the dumb red spots on it out. I personally don't like lures with spots, but they had a big year last year. Um, all of a sudden the fish hit it. So, you know, the fish see things that we don't see. So um, I guess I'm also saying be aggressive with changing lures. If you know the fish are there, if you see other people catching fish and you're not, you know, you'd go with the red. If the red doesn't work, go with the orange. Um, and that's another thing on like steelhead. And last year was a weak year on steelhead, yeah. at least in the southern area. part of the lake. Yeah. And I saw guys with pictures up north that had a lot of steelhead, more than we had. But with the steelhead, you know, they're they have you know they got great big eyeballs. I think they have better eyesight than the other fish. What do I know? Um, so for them, some days they do like orange, some days they like red. So you're just changing until you find what they want. Like Rob said, let the fish tell you what they want. Let me piggyback off that and ask you this: uh, Is uh, what's your philosophy when it comes to frequency in changing? How often is there a time period? I think that's a, a, a big part for, so for newer guys and even for more experienced guys. How, you know, how long do I let this set up soak 
how fast do I change it? What, yeah, yeah. So that? how fast? Do you, when do you change lures? That's the million dollar question. Uh, we talk a lot about that at day, our day one salmon school. Um, January 21st, right here, you local guys. Um, so my philosophy is if you are, if you know there's no fish there, you're on hunting mode. Nobody's catching fish. The graph is empty. Don't change a lot of lures because you're looking for the fish. If you know the fish are there, be aggressive with changing the lures. Um, you're marking fish. You see them zipping around. Um, so here's my, 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 my idea. So let's say you're running seven rods. So you got three rods with your studs. Dylan told you one of his stud lures, okay? So you are three studs. You don't change them because if the fish turn on, you want to make sure there's something in there. Then you're going to take three rods, and I'm going to change them every 15 minutes. Maybe that fourth rod or that last rod that you're not, you're kind of in between on that. But what you're doing is you're using those rods, you're changing, trying to find what they want, but you're still leaving some key lures in there that you know are good for the conditions for that time of year, just in case it, the fish are just off. Because sometimes they're just off. Mm -hmm. So good strategy. Yeah, that helps a lot because a lot of people can get really stuck on, oh, I'll leave it longer and maybe they should have changed it sooner and vice versa. And it can get very overwhelming for, for folks to sort through and, that. And, and there's, you know, the other thing a lot of people don't do um, is we talk about, you know, I talk about these in my books. Um, a lot of times it's, you, you may have the right lure and fly out there, but you just don't have it in the right spot. So for example, you may have it 10 feet behind the downrigger and it needs to be 100 feet behind the downrigger. Or you may have it out on a two setting on a diver out 200 feet and it needs to be on a three and a half setting out 400 feet. So some, sometimes before changing the lure, you need to put it in a different spot. Um, sometimes it's also packing your lures together. Sometimes it's, it's spreading them out. So yeah. there's all a, lot, the, a lot of little details. Yeah, all the variables that go into it. All right, let's uh, move on to another question here. Uh, let's see from, <clears throat> um, from David. Is there, or what is the best app or web link to use daily to follow Lake Michigan Current? Anybody have an input on that? I haven't looked at the currents online in a long time. I know yeah. Noah always had a current map on, on their website, and uh, it's not exactly intuitive. It's a little, it's for the times that we're into, it can be kind of like. Yeah, I haven't looked like, at it in a long time. There yeah. is an app out there. I don't know the name of it, but I've heard of people talking about it and seen it all Do over. Just Google it. You can, yeah. The one wasn't working <laughs> last year. They didn't have funding. The one. The one surface current one. You're right. Yeah. That one was down last year. Oh, okay. I think I heard it was because of funding, um, but I know I looked at one just the other day randomly, and it was up, but not that one. It was just again, just Google, you know, Lake Michigan surface currents or Lake mm -hmm. Ontario surface currents or whatever, like here on. Yeah, I'm trying to thought of one. I, I don't know that there's like one that's super uh, great out there, but uh, yeah, so you can do that. Sorry if we didn't <laughs> fully help out on that question. I, I tend to think we, we tend to look more at the wind uh, uh, apps, I feel like, more than anything, just kind of see what's going on with the winds. Yeah, you know what? I just uh, started using Fish Weather, and that's that's a really good one. I know we had a, a podcast about it a long time ago, and I was pushing sail flow. Mm -hmm. That one stinks now, but... Uh, Fish weather is really good. Thank, thanks for just not letting me know this whole this whole time. <laughs> you see, withholding information all the time, I swear. All right. Um, let's see here, uh, from S Stefan, hopefully I said that prop, uh, correctly. What's up, man? Hello everyone. How deep I should fish the crankbaits for uh, crankbaits for early coho fishing. I fish a lot for bass and I am a beginner for salmon. Thank you, Rob. I like my crankbaits near the surface. So, uh, you know, I use a lot of bread or I use a lot of bread stint fish and a lot of other people do for early spring fish. You know, they get down four to six feet at the very most. I don't do anything to get them down any further than that. Um, if I do need to get a little further, then I'll start running a deeper bait, like a flicker shad. And still, you know, it's going to max out about 12 feet down if you put enough line out. And most of the time, that's as far as you need to go. Yeah, exactly. So try that out. Especially, he, he's, he mentioned in the follow-up that he's in a kayak as well, which is why I threw it to you. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Uh, question from... Uh, from Oh, uh, Brandon again. Do you generally run spoons up high and a flasher deeper, flash a fly deeper? Uh, no, I don't. Um, well, it depends. Flasher flies usually, if I'm like trout fishing, it'll always be, you know, one of my deepest rods. But 
When you're lake trout fishing. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't really do that. So, um, but no. There, there. <laughs> it, no, I don't. Because there's times where I'm tracing bottom because I see, like, if the kings are staging, the, I'll, I could use anything and be tracing the bottom with it. Be, and if they're just packed on the bottom, then I'll, that's what I'll be doing. But, yeah. No, I, I wouldn't say that I'm putting my flashers always in my deepest rod. Plus, I'll have spoons on my. I don't really like running flasher flies on 450 hoppers because they're you know pretty hard to. I don't enjoy railing them in after that, so I'll put a spoon on there, and that's pretty. That's pretty deep. So. Okay, this is a perfect segue. Segue. Segue for this. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to pull it on the screen just because I'm going to have to uh, change a word in, in the question here. But if you put a pew pew to your head, all right, uh, you're following all, yeah, because it's Facebook and you say things and next, you know, uh, so if, you put a, if you put a pew pew to your, to your head and you only have one spoon to choose to catch a king, what are you picking? We'll start down here. What's a pew pew to your head? Pew pew, like oh. a. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, okay, yeah. I, that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I no. just wanted to make sure I'm not missing the, something. Because reading that aloud yeah. and Facebook would have flagged yeah. and then we're all. In yeah, trouble, we'd so. be shut down. We don't yeah. want to do that. Yeah, golly, that's a million. What it's one? Good, good. One spoon. Can I have yeah. three? No. Uh, okay. Is, it, is it for kings? Yeah, you did say for kings. All right. It's old school. It's gonna be a uh, regular. Not UV, just a regular green flounder pounder, moonshine. If I only get one, it's like this, but not the RV. Yeah, one. Dan's yeah. old, so he doesn't like the new flashy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee. Do you notice Easy. different? Do you, have you over the years noticed difference between non RV RV? Oh yeah, or... absolutely. It's a, whether some days they do hit the RV one better, and and some days they hit the regular one better. That's I mean, you have to change. Like if you're using a green moonshine. You got to go, all right, the green moonshine didn't, flounder pounder didn't work. Okay, now you have to try the RV because they may hit, they, they may hit. Um, the, the, the tape. The tape one, yeah. It's the younger fish that, you know, they go for the flashy stuff. You know how that kids are. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Rob? You know, I'm just going to go with the uh, the old Glow Crush Magnum Pro King. Yeah, you do like that one. Yeah. Dylan? Uh, yeah, probably the same. Same, but the RV one is Dan. I, any of the moonshine ones are really good. So that's, if I were to just target with one brand of spoon, it would probably be that. But yeah, that's the green ones you really can't go wrong with, in my opinion. That's another question. What brand, if you can only run one brand of spoon? That's oh. a lot more room to answer. Yes. Yeah. I'd like that, Dylan. Nice. You just put a whole bunch more lures in your one spoon bucket. Yeah. All right. Um... We'll get a question here from Alex. How do you determine what speed you should be trolling at? Uh, you kind of let the fish do that. Uh, if I'm not catching fish, I'm trolling. Fa I usually troll faster, which I don't know if a lot of people do. But my thought process of it is that you don't necessarily troll because the a certain speed because the fish only hit it at that speed. It's because your act, your lures are you know made to go that fast. But there's a threshold to it. So if you're trolling at the upper threshold because you're not catching fish in one area. And now you're in that position where, hey, I'm going to search for fish. Why would you want to troll slow while you're searching for fish? Because you're covering more ground going faster. So I troll faster. And when I get on the fish, I'll start backing it down again. And then just so I'm staying with them. And then if I you know, randomly stop getting bites because I'm going too slow now, uh, then I'll you know kick it back up. Let, let me ask you two follow-ups on that. One, could you... Could you uh... Could you clarify what fast is for you so people have an understanding of yeah, and what, gonna, what speed range is for you fast? Yeah, it's going to be different on the Michigan side. And our side uses knots for some reason, and the Michigan side uses miles per hour. But And they have a lot more current up there, so it's different. But on our side, when there's you know not really a current, I'm going anywhere from two knots to 2.7 or 2.8 knots which is on the faster side but so i don't know what that would be like 2.1 to three miles an hour about uh and then if i'm if i am late trout fishing in the rare currents i'll, I'll back it back down but sometimes they want it faster as well so got you um does your spread also kind of dictate because you have certain things on there you could wash that out if you're going too fast no 
Yeah. So you have to kind of be cognizant of what is yeah. in your spread. Yeah, like the Dodgers. If I'm using the old metal Dodgers, they'll start spinning. A lot of times I'll be watching those, and that'll, uh, you know, if my I had a issue with my uh, fish hawk for a week, it was just down and got a new one. But in that time, I was just watching my lures at that time, and you know, you could kind of determine your speed at a certain point. You could watch your dipsies, or if you could see them because it's clear water now, and they're spinning. Uh, you're going too fast, so back it down a little bit. But it really uh, dependent. I mean, spin doctors are so speed tolerant, so you could go a lot quicker with those. Yeah. Dan, for you, uh, as far as speed in terms of trolling, what speed? So I typically set lines on the fast side because it's easier to get the lures in the water going fast. So typically that's going to be like 2.7 knots, which is about 3.1, 3.2 miles per hour. That's typically where I'll start at. And then depending if it looks good, if I'm getting fish, you know, then I'll back it off. But the general speed range is going to be in knots, like 1.9 to 2.8 knots. So miles per hour, that'd be like 1.7 to 3.3 miles per hour. That's the general range, range to look in. Um, if I am trolling faster, you know, in the spring, I love these, you know, the action flashers and the little the baby spin doctors. I'll put long leaders on them you know, four wraps of the Dodger Flasher because it slows the fly down. Because mm -hmm. like Dylan was talking about, like to troll fast cover ground. Um, so you're, you're slowing the fly down. Um, spoons, the spoons that we use, like the Super Slims um, and the Moonshines, they're really speed tolerant. So you can go all over the place on, on, on speeds with those. That's one reason, you know, Super Slims and Moonshines work so good. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But yeah, and just one other thing is yeah. a, lot of, a lot of people think that you have to go 2.1. For whatever reason, that's a popular number. There's just days where the fish, you know, the fish can swim a lot faster than two miles an hour. And I think a lot of people troll too slow. That's a good point. Actually, a good point. Um, guys, we want to make sure, uh, get the last few questions in here so we can answer them. Because we're we're going to be pressing up on time here. And uh, so if you got anything, make sure you ask it now so I can kind of put it in the, in the question queue. Uh, and while we're at it, if you're enjoying the uh, live stream, make sure you give it a thumbs up, share, subscribe to the YouTube channel. We're, we're just under or just over 50 subs away on our YouTube channel from hitting our first 1,000. So if you want to help us hit that goal for, for uh, Lake Michigan Anglers, greatly appreciated. Uh, with that being said, let's get into a couple more questions here. Uh, right, let's see. <clears throat> from Jacob. What current is more important to watch or affects the fish more, a surface or a deep current? Yeah. Well, the surface current is going to drive the deep currents because the currents are created when the wind when the wind blows on the surface of the water. It's pushing the water. So once a thermocline sets up, the, the water is stratified. So, you know, um, <clears throat> it's actually pushing that layer of water that across the thermocline hits the far shore, hits another mass of water, um, and the bottom layer will sometimes be moving in a different direction. So the surface current drives the bottom current. Both are super important. Both of them will influence water temperature and where the fish are at. Um, both of them will influence our lures. But from, you know, on a technical fishing perspective, if you're, okay, let's say we're, you're out there fishing and you have a fish hawk, um, you have your GPS for speed, and you've got some fish that are up higher in the water column where the surface current's at play. Then you have some fish down by the bottom, Mr. King Salmon or um, Dylan's Pet Lake Trout. <laughs> um, I knew that by, was coming. <laughs> by the bottom, you've got the bottom current at play. So you have to figure out the current where your lures are at. That, so when you're fishing, yes. So if your lures and you're targeting kings on the bottom, then the bottom current is more important for matching your lure speed. But backing up, both upper and lower currents are going to drive the water column and steer fish migrations. Awesome. Uh, Hot Fish Lures said, great information from all here. Thanks, gentlemen. Hey, thank you for being here. And uh, we're happy to uh, uh, be able to get these uh, great panelists here to share their wealth of information. Um, I, I love being here uh, just to listen, just like you guys are. And it, it's, it's always good, always good. Um, let's pick a question here from Jesse. Good to see you all. Question between all the other species we chase, we chase, and of course, hunting season, <laughs> if there are only three months out of the year, what three months would you make sure you're out there? Hottest time for ROI? Great question. I'd break it up. 
I, okay. Yeah. Let's, yeah, let's hear it. Let's hear it. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what would it be? What, what, how would you stagger it? I'd be here in May. Okay. By, uh, May and for what species? Coho. Okay. May for coho. And then where there are king, a lot of king, a big king population, I'd make sure to be there, you know, when they're trying to enter the pair heads are staging. So, so it's like a fall, fall period. August and September. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is, is hunting season's good when, well, <clears throat> I guess not, not for salmon, but. No, because hunting is what, October yeah, starts, right? Yeah. That's usually, yeah. yeah. So I usually, I personally transition into crappie for October. But the trout start, you know, if you like hitting the harbors and the rivers and stuff with the browns and steel and all that. It's usually when that gets going. Yeah. So it really just depends on what you want to catch. I'm thinking, you know, really dial it in too much. If you want to catch kings, and then Dylan really summed it up. If you want to catch other fish, it might be a different season. Okay. Uh, Dan, any? I'd say May, uh, on this side of the lake for the cohos and rainbows. Michigan's got kings in May. And then July and August. Those are my three. But... Cool. All right. Thank you for the question, Jesse. All right, let's see. Next question from Scott. What considerations do you have when deciding how far to put a lure behind a cannonball or a diver? For example, is it something like clear water, 50 feet, 50 feet plus back, colored water, 50 feet or less? Yeah, kind of. Um, it, it could be viewed as that, but it's also how far down are you putting it? Because if it's clear water, yeah, I guess, but you wouldn't be putting it down on the bottom, you know, a hundred feet back because it's clear water or you you might, you know, end up getting tangled with something, but yeah. And it depends like the lure selection and how skittish the fish are. Um, so like in the early morning, it's usually closer because the fish are more aggressive as the, you know, the sun comes up and the, it gets clearer and fish are easier to see, I'm spreading my stuff back further because a lot of times that initial bite slows down and it's just they're a little bit more boat shy depending on the boat traffic. So yeah, I'd say tighter in the morning, uh, anywhere from you know, t 20 to 50, 40 feet and then past that uh, in the, like as the day goes on. Okay, Ben? I would concur with that. Yeah, it's it's more of, um, you know, depends early in the day closer, but also, you know, sometimes further down in the water column, you can get away with running it closer, um, whether it's clear or not. But uh, another thing, it's just it's the mood of the fish, too. So that's one of those variables you just have to change short, long, medium, just keep, you know, keep changing things. Yeah. And one thing that we really observed last year and year before that was uh, the speed, you know, when we run, especially running the flashers and dodgers behind dodgers and guys going slower tend to have better luck with the shorter lead behind the ball and faster fishermen are doing better with the long lead behind the ball going to their flashers just changing the action of the lures just goes to show you there's many ways to be successful yeah it really is it really is uh all right we've got the last of the questions in here so we're gonna go through them and we'll kind of uh get through this so next question here from uh Kuwaitin. Uh, let's see. He says, can you explain how the ball speed versus boat speed is different? Has never really made sense. Dan, a brief summation of that. So how the ball speed versus boat speed? What, okay. How, can you explain what, why? Ball speed. Why boat, so there's three ways. Um, three ways to look at to measure your speed. There's through the water, like a paddle wheel on it. Then there's ground speed measured by your GPS. That's the speed that the boat is moving over the bottom of the lake. Then there's your probe speed. Probe is on the downrigger weight, 50 feet down, 100 feet down. That's the speed that the downrigger weight in the probe is moving through the water. So because of the currents, you know, your ground speed measured by the GPS, speed over ground, a um, super important number. We talk a lot about that at salmon schools and in my books. Um, that can be a very different number than your probe speed. Um, probe speed gives you the speed of one lure at one depth. Ground speed is my, my that's my ground, speed over ground, GPS. That's what I use to dial in my whole spread. That's that's what I'm measuring my speed on. You know, I'm gonna use the probe speed to dial into the current and try and figure things out closer, you know, a little uh, more detailed then. Cool. Hopefully that answers your question. All right, we'll go to the next one here. Uh, let's see. 
Uh, Zypher asked a question. Hi, everyone. Great show. Question for Rob. Is the shipment in yet? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a like a cartel deal here. Like, Which is one? In yet? <laughs> there's a there's a big one coming tomorrow. They're coming like every day yeah. or every other day. We, so we got a really big one tomorrow though. We got a whole thing of stinger flashers in. Yep, that came in. Uh, reels are in. Like there's a, yeah. a lot of Okuma stuff coming tomorrow. There's I don't even know everything coming tomorrow. There might be nets. There might be um, some other lures that I forgot I ordered. There could be all kinds of stuff on it tomorrow. Visit LakeMichiganAngler.com, guys. You can order stuff online. You can place orders over the phone. You can stop by as well to check out all the stuff. Uh, and so, yep, stay posted there as well as on our Facebook. When we get stuff in, we'll post it typically to Instagram and Facebook. So you guys that are there on our social media kind of get, like, the first dibs, if you will, or first notice, if, if anything. Uh, all right, let's move along quickly here. Brody said, lure selection choices on a rough spring day where the small boat fisherman fights crabbing or speed changes by crabbing i'm assuming what just cluttered or just grouped up uh lure selection choices really on the situation they're facing that uh i'm i'm saying that they're i'm reading this as like they're having a hard time maintaining their speed okay is that okay uh if that is i would pick lures uh or find a speed that you know you're a, your bottom line isn't fluctuating too much about how you would normally troll or simple if you can and the fish are biting the way you turn with the waves. That's what I did a lot on my little boat. I would do, it's kind of a pain, but I would go one direction and if they were too big of waves to troll into or turn into, I would pull all my stuff and go back to where I started and do it again if the fish were there. But if not, you pick some more speed tolerance stuff. So. For example, if I, I would always run uh, spin doctors, uh, which I think are getting a little bit bigger on our side of the lake. So, But they're, they just handle speed. There's a huge fluctuation of speed you could use for them. Cool. All right. Next question quickly here. It's for Rob uh, from Lloyd. Does braid color matter for backer on long lines or dipsies? No, I don't think so. If it's backer, it doesn't matter at all. Just go with what you like. Okay. Uh, Dan. Uh, when should you be fishing below the thermocline at or above for kings? Yes. So you should. So when you're fishing for kings, typically earlier in the morning or later in the day, a lot of times up above the thermocline, in the thermocline, and just below it might be better. But in the middle of the day, like Dylan said earlier, you always want one or two rods out of if you have enough rods out of temperature above the thermocline. And then the rest, you're gonna you're gonna move them around from the thermocline to the bottom. I always keep, I like to keep a rod on the bottom. Even in 250, 300 feet of water, I like to keep a rod on the bottom because um, there's just big fish down there. Um, so if you're limited on rod selection, then that's gonna require you to like move things around trying to trying to chase the fish. So you you really you know during the day those kings could be anywhere. The other thing is the water's clear. So a lot of times you may have a side planer that's up in the thermocline, but those kings are living below it, but they can see pretty far in the clear water. Um, and then just to back up to that two questions ago about the boat when you mentioned crabbing, because my Atlantic used to crab terribly. I'd go sideways sometimes a lot. In the spring, if you're fishing over here then in that crabbing situation, I love the Jensen Dodgers, both the double O and the big O. But on short leads, on light downrigger weights, like a six pound or an eight pound downrigger weight, because you're crabbing and it's going to move around a lot. And a short lead with these Jensen Dodgers, they'll spin and they'll flutter like that and then they'll spin. And then running a diver, you know, again, spring, so I'm going to assume it's coho over here. Mm -hmm. Running a diver just outside of it with a short lead from the diver to the Jensen Dodger, like three feet, four feet. Because as it crabs, it's going to sink and, and flutter and sink and spin and flutter. And the cohos do like that. But like what Dylan also said, I concur that the spin doctors are very speed tolerant, though, too. Awesome. Uh, Cody said, just got home from work, came in too late, missed all the info. Uh, you didn't miss anything, guys. Uh, you can watch this replay. It'll be both on our Facebook and the YouTube channel. Uh, you can watch the VOD uh, at your leisure uh, as you're driving about or whenever you want with your coffee. So. Mm -hmm. You didn't miss too much. You can always go back and rewatch it. Uh, let's see here from Bill. Guys, thanks for taking the time out to put this on tonight. Great info. and can't wait for spring to get here. Dan, can't wait to get to one of your schools. And Rob, thanks for the job you guys do at LMA. I'm um, sure. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right. Uh, Rob from Kyle. Okuma wire roller rods? Question mark. <laughs> Is there a certain one that you want? I have uh, a couple in stock right now. I should be getting a whole bunch more tomorrow. There should be some of the classic pros with the AFCO guides that are kind of like the old Taloras. There should be some cheaper ones. Um, I won't really know until it's here. I ordered it all in September, and I don't remember exactly what's coming. So it's just I just know it's going to be a lot of stuff. Stuff is coming. Yep. From Thomas, really – oops, sorry. Let's pull it back up here. There we go. Uh, Thomas, really enjoy all your podcasts, and uh, Mike's, Shasta Yeager, too. Thank you. Appreciate you guys joining the uh, podcast. Uh, let's see here. Uh, f- uh, Jaybird said, what's your go-to lure for spring coho after ice out, peanut fly, spoons, et cetera? Sorry, were you, Dylan? Just run through. Yeah, uh, the breads, thin fins usually are pretty good. Uh, besides that, I don't normally fish too much when there's ice out. So it's usually down in like Indiana or so. So Got you. Rob? Yeah, the, the thin fish right at ice out, you know, until that water starts warming up a little bit. Cool. Dan? I don't fish a lot right at ice out. Um, so, but right after, right at, right after ice out, <laughs> it'd be a blue, green, and gold peanut fly. Yeah. Solid. Uh, all right. From Doug Scott, if you had to choose between using a fish hawk or one of the newer technologies like Live Scope, Mega Live, Active Target for trolling, which one would you choose? Uh, l- l- I'll just say this real quick, and I'll throw it to somebody else. That these are they're two different technologies completely. They're they're not in the same sense. Where, whereas Live Scope, Mega, and Active are a live, in generally a live imaging platform. Fish hawk is is a probe system that allows you to get your temp at the ball of your weights and your speed at the ball where live imaging allows you to see those fish real time coming in and out of your spread. So they're two separate uh, things entirely. Um, so, so uh, there you go. It's not, even, it's not even a comparison. There's just two separate things. So I'll just answer that for you there. Uh, all right. Cody asks, what baits to start with for spring Kings? Stan? Hmm. Well, I would do a, in the spring, I think I like spoons more than flashers and flies in the spring. So I would be starting with um, some moonshines, both the magnum and the regular size um, color. You know, there's the green flounder. Um, there's there's a lot of good moonshine colors. Um, there's the UV, there's your young one, Dylan. The <laughs> UV agent orange can be deadly. Um, on coppers, 200, 300 coppers. Um, the uh, blue flounder. Um, but I would also mix some flashers and flies in. I think in the spring, early spring, I like the 11 inch. I like the, the plain white 11 inch Dreamweaver paddle, um, you know, with either a, a super frog or actually I like the pearl spinning glow with the pink spots with a half cut little boy blue Howie fly on its tail. Um, on a really long leader behind the 11 inch Dreamweaver white paddle, because in the spring, a lot of times I'm trolling faster because I'm also trying to catch steelhead up high and it's, it's hunting, at least on our, our side of the lake, it's hunting. The Kings aren't concentrated like on the other side of the lake. Um, so I would have one of those down there in the mix and then some more spoons. Um, last year over in Ludington in the spring, in the spring before that, before that I fished in Petwater over there. Um, then, you know, the, the Magnum, uh, uh, stinger, the Magnum stinger and the big dream weaver in the blue dolphin and that goofy one that JR likes with the spots on it, Dylan, I can't remember the name. I, that was good. This last spring out of Ludington in May. Um, yeah, I just put a picture of it in my presentation, oh, I'm sure um, gonna love that. but I don't know the name of it. That's terrible. There's too many spoons, uh, on it. But it, it's going to be more Magnum spoons in the springtime um, for the Kings. And uh, final question here from Mike Smith. Ask Dylan if he's ever caught a muskie out there while salmon fishing. Is there a story behind this? No. <laughs> oh, no? <laughs> oh. A <laughs> oh, there's always a story behind Mike Smith. <laughs> Where are you? Mike, are you hiding in the closet here? Where is he? <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure he's caught one then. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Uh, so thank you all for the for the 
the great questions uh, as we're going to wind it up here. Um, uh, Dan, just to kind of recap, we'll make sure we, 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 we touched on some of the things that you wanted to touch on. Was there anything that we may have uh, uh, not a, uh, brought up by chance? No, we, we, you know, we covered a lot of ground. I mean, there's, there's so much to this puzzle yeah. of salmon fishing. It's just, you know, once you start pulling things out, you could just keep going if you wanted to. You, so. you really yeah. could because a lot of the guys, the questions they asked were great. Yeah. And, and they're so intricate. And it, it, like you said, it depends. Is it spring? Is it summer? Am I fishing deep? Am I in shallow? And so many yeah. variables. I mean, the one thing I would add that we didn't talk about is last spring, and Rob, you can say more on this, there was really good brown trout fishing. There was. Um, it was actually around here. It was the best brown trout fishing we had in several years. Um, and so that's like, you know, ice out around here is typically more brown trout than yeah. it is cohos. And, uh, yeah, hopefully we, we see that again, you know. And it seems like this going in this winter period has been, has been, it's been, it's been, it's been you, you should be able to catch them right now. I mean, the guys are catching them in, in Oak Creek, Milwaukee, and those areas. We could yeah. probably catch them here too. Sure. Sure. Um, so, okay. Uh, and let's pull this up right here one more time. Guys, don't forget that Captain Dan Keating will be here at Lake Michigan Angler for Salmon School, January 21st, 22nd. That's right around the corner. That's next weekend, actually. Uh, so a week from this Saturday, you can register at uh, CaptainDanKeating.com for the class. Uh, you'll come here day one, day two, as he mentioned before, day one's like the kind of cover the basics and stuff. And, you know, when you hear the basics, don't think like this is, you know, when we say basics, people might think like put pole in water, you know, like it's not like that. It's very in depth. I've been here for his class and, and it's still very much in depth and, uh, answers a lot of questions from the people that are in here. And then day two is more advanced where you talk about like really more intricate stuff and it, it adds on from day one. So really great. And on top of that, a lot of stuff that he'll talk about and that he uses and he recommends a lot of the gear. We have it here. Rods, reels are coming in big shipment by the time salmon school next Saturday, it's gonna be a lot of stuff in the store. And it's, and we should note that for those of you that are coming, you can place orders and call them in or place them on the web. Uh, through LakeMichiganAngler.com, and just pick them up when you come here. Yeah, you so can you just save just stuff. in-store pickup on the website, yeah. and then just shoot me an email saying you'll get it the day of the, the class. Yeah, save yourself the shipping costs and, and, and everything, and, or you just get it all together while you're here in the school, get what you need, and uh, secure it before it's all gone, because that's usually how it goes. We'll, we'll get stuff in, and then it's gone. Um, I think we covered about everything. Uh, I'm excited about 2023, again, to kind of compare – uh, how things fish for 2022. Hopefully we see a better run for Kings for us this on this side uh, compared to what we saw um, this past like summer and the fall period. Uh, Dan, what would you say compared to last year? What's something you would like to see either stay the same or uh, or more of compared to last year as far as fishing goes? Uh, that I can go fishing more? <laughs> <laughs> that it's always caught? No, I think it's going to be a really good year for kings. There were a lot of big kings caught last year all around the lake. Yeah. So I'm just hopeful that, you know, there's a lot of plus 30-pound fish again. That was a lot of fun. Um, you know, I think the coho population is fine. Hopefully we have more steelhead this year. Yeah. But I, I think it's going to be a good year. Yeah. I really do. Billy, what about you? Yeah, same thing. I, I think it's going to be a good year. I think... You know, coho is going to be good, and then hopefully there's some kings on this side. But if not, I'll travel to them. So we <laughs> we didn't really dive into the story about your experience out there, but we'll, we'll have to say that for another day. But you you really had a clinic. I, I think uh, Captain Blake went with you as well, and uh, I've seen pictures of you guys with like a full five guy boat limit of all kings. Yeah, but uh, like yeah, and a lot of it had to Jeez. do with, had what had to do with the guys over there so dan introduced me to greg and then i met uh jeremy barber and they, you know they were very helpful um showing me the way and same with jr who's a good friend of mine now work with them and without them for sure a um a noticeable difference in how they are fishing for the kings versus how we would do it over here yeah and i swear every port uh like not every port but if you go up to sturgeon bay you know they fish completely different than we're fishing the guys in michigan are fishing completely different so um it's about adapting and seeing you know our stuff will work over there and their stuff will work over here everyone's yeah. just got their different ways to do things yeah dylan's a good guy to take a teaching charter with um dylan also caught a five-man limit of kings in sturgeon bay this year 
uh, went to Michigan. He Dylan went a lot of places and caught a lot of kings, but he's a good, yeah. he's patient. He's a good guy to do a teaching charter with too. So on that note, Dylan, would you let people know where they can contact you at? Yeah, you can contact me. It's uh, Legacy Sport Fishing uh, Charters. It's on Facebook, or uh, you can give me a call six, or uh, you can email me Legacy Sport Fishing LLC at gmail.com. And yeah, I'll be happy to take anyone who wants to go. And if you didn't remember that, just go through my website and I can give you Dylan's number. There you go. And of course, you guys know where you can reach uh, Captain Dan Keating on his website, CaptainDanKeating.com. And uh, you're also on Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. Of course. So you can also find them on there as well. Um, Rob, any final thoughts? Anything you want to mention? We cover everything? Should I just say the usual? I'm looking forward to fishing this spring. Yeah, say your, say your usual line because he's so talkative on these episodes. You guys notice that right now. Someone needs to make him a meme already. I don't know how he's not become a meme. Go ahead. Sign off, Rob. Just looking forward to getting the season started and catching some fish. Blah, 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 blah. Thanks for watching. <laughs> like, subscribe, guys, and make sure to visit LakeMichiganAngler.com for all your fishing tackle needs. Not just salmon and trout. We also have ice fishing stuff right now and all of that. So hit us up. Thank you, guys. Thank you to our guests. Have a great, wonderful night, and we'll see you guys next time. Take care.